Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. I'm going to spend my time up here to convince you that the way we currently manage our natural resources and the planet is pretty much like a giant Ponzi scheme, and that unfortunately all of you are investors. The good news is that we have alternative options, and I'm going to lay some of those out for you. So there's a few key things about Ponzi schemes. One is that the investments are made using borrowed capital. And the more commonly understood part of it is that the returns often seem too good to be true, because in the end, they are. And these two features are true of the way we manage most of our natural resources now. The way we produce water, the way we produce food, the way we extract energy and timber and fish, even the way we protect ourselves from storms and floods. In every one of these cases, we are making incredibly risky investments that are not safe and we pretend that they are. And in each of these cases, we have an alternative in investing in nature that's much less risky. So I'm gonna tell you some of those stories, but I'm gonna start with an extreme story to really get you thinking about what I'm talking about. So imagine you're a woodworker. This is my dad, he's a woodworker. So let's imagine we're my dad. To do any projects, you need to have wood, obviously. You usually go to the store to get that wood. And let's imagine in this story that the store we go to does things a little differently. They get their wood from the source, and then they lease the wood to a demolition derby for six months. They put the wood along the sides of the track, and the cars slam into it, and it gets really dirty and beat up and oily and burned, and then they take the wood back and put it on the shelf and sell it to you. You get a pretty good price, and then you go home and you spend days, if not weeks, cleaning up that wood and sanding it back into shape before you can start your project. Now, I spent some time this summer with my dad building a wooden boat, and I understand just how much it takes to sand even good wood into shape. So this just gives me a, a visceral understanding of how ridiculous this option would be. But it might seem that in any case, paying money for a product that is so in such bad shape that we have to spend a lot of our own time and resources to fix it before we can use it is unthinkable. But that is exactly what we do with our water supply. In the United States, most of the drinking surface water um, has to be treated before we can drink it. Now, rain doesn't fall from the sky dirty in most places anymore. You could drink it when it falls. But then this water has to go through sort of the gauntlet of a watershed. Maybe it flows across a pasture and picks up some bacteria and puts that into our water supply. In other parts of the watershed, the water might flow across a farm field, picking up agrochemicals and pesticides and fertilizers and adding that into the mix. Further downstream, maybe it picks up some soil that's eroded and even some additional pollutants from an industrial complex. This is the demolition derby that we put our water through now. And you as taxpayers even pay for some of that damage to happen. We subsidize farmers to put chemicals on their fields, some of which run off and add to our difficulties in the water supply. And then you get to pay for it again to treat it before you can drink it. So we are in the scheme that the crazy woodworking story was that I told. And there is another way that we can do this. We can pay to invest in keeping water clean at the source. And we can pay to keep nature in place to do that. So what would this look like? We could take some of the money that we currently spend on water treatment and invest it instead on keeping nature in place where it's in good shape. Then the roots of plants and trees and the soil itself act as filters and take contaminants out of the system before they reach our rivers. We could also pay to restore nature where it's not in such good shape especially along rivers, so that we can have a buffer between critical farm fields that we need to produce our food and the water supply that we need to keep clean. We could even pay private landowners to change the way they herd cattle or grow crops so that we stop pollution at the source. Any of these activities would keep our water cleaner along its path and lower our water treatment costs by the time it gets to us. Now, these aren't just wistful dreams of a scientist. These ideas are good enough that people are starting to invest in them. Maybe not surprisingly, New York City was the first in 1996. They needed to build a new water treatment facility, and they costed that out at $8 billion. Instead of spending that money, they spent $1.5 billion on investing in nature. They bought some forests in the Catskills, they put some uh, riparian areas back through restoration, and they made some payments to landowners in the way that I described. So far, they haven't had to build another water treatment facility, and so, so far, this investment is really paying off so much so that other cities are following suit. Seattle does the same thing, San Antonio, Texas does the same thing, even Beijing 
invests in keeping their water clean at the source. Maybe even more shockingly, companies are starting to follow suit. Coca-Cola is a company that obviously has a huge dependence on water. They have their secret recipe, but without water, there's no Coke. And so they know that, and they know that water is critical to their company and their entire supply chain. So they see the riskiness and the ridiculousness of our current water system, and they've made a commitment to become water neutral by 2020. And the way they're doing that is by making investments in nature and securing clean water supplies where they need it. Now, I want to emphasize just how much money is involved in this choice that we have. In 2007 alone, in the United States, the federal government spent $101 billion on our water infrastructure. This is what we use to clean our water and move it around. Now, at the peak of uh, Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme, which took him 30 years to put together, he had $65 million in hand. So, I'm sorry, $65 billion in hand. So in one year alone, we, the taxpayers of the United States, put more money into our water systems than he acquired over 30 years of the biggest Ponzi scheme ever. So the point here is not that we don't need to spend this money. We have to have clean water. We need some infrastructure to help us out in key places. But we can take a lot of this money and invest it in a much less risky and higher return way by investing some of it in nature. So let's think about another example. Let's think about the way we protect ourselves from storms and floods. Vicki referred to this a little bit already. Um, right now, we put all of our bets in one solution here, and that's concrete. Concrete's great. It's very strong. We can manipulate it, we can put it where we want it, when we want it, and often it's really effective. But it doesn't always work, and we saw that really clearly in Superstorm Sandy. In some places, the waves took the break walls that were supposed to protect houses and used them as bulldozers to shovel sand across the beach, and then it used them as ramps to jump up over onto the houses directly. So obviously not exactly what we wanted them to do, and that doesn't always happen. But we do have another option here to complement the concrete solutions that we'll need in some cases, and that again is investing in nature. This is a salt marsh, and salt marshes and dunes and oyster reefs and coral reefs can all provide us some protection from storm waters. You've all probably had a windy day at the beach when you've looked for refuge behind some dunes. And those dunes and many of these other habitat types can slow down water during storms, just like dunes slow down wind on the beach. And the, there's been some activity in starting to make these kinds of investments. The Nature Conservancy has a project in Washington State in the Fisher Slough, where there was an aging levee that you can see here around some important agricultural fields. The levee was old, as most of our infrastructure is in the US now. And instead of putting it back in place, they moved it a little ways into the agricultural fields, working with local farmers. So they did rebuild the levee, but in between the levee and the river, they put back the salt marsh. So this tag team effect of nature and, and, and the levee ended up working really well. With the old levee, the uh, system could withstand the size of flood that happens about once every five years. Right after this project was completed, the two together, the salt marsh and the levee, held back a 10-year return storm size event, so a much bigger event that would have flooded the fields in the past. This project also opened up 15 miles of additional river for salmon migration. So we get another benefit out of this choice for protection that gives us healthier fish and healthier fisheries. So I've talked a lot about water. I'm going to give you one more example here related to our food systems. There's been a lot of movements around food production lately. The local food movement, the non-GMO, the organic, the slow food, the free range, the cage free, the grass fed. And they're all really interesting and important. But there's one missing. And it's really surprising that it's missing because it is the main way we grow our food. And I like to refer to it as the put all your eggs in one basket method, which is maybe why nobody talks about it. But the, de the, the main point here is that if you fly across the United States or look at Google Earth, as I did here, you will see something like this. Wall-to-wall -wall agriculture of usually one or two crops from edge to edge of the landscape. What's shocking about this is that this used to be wall-to-wall -wall forest. And now we only see forests in those tiny areas around houses and in cities like the one on the left. Those are the only places that trees are left in this landscape. Now, I'm not going to bemoan the consequences of that habitat loss for plants and animals because I'm sure you've heard that before. What I'm going to draw out for you is the consequence of that habitat loss for the crops themselves. So if we lose this habitat around croplands, Oh, sorry, I also wanted to say, if you zoom out in these places, you see this continuous pattern of wall-to-wall -wall agriculture for hundreds and hundreds of miles. 
And so if we lose these critical habitats in our agricultural areas, we also lose support for key things that we need like pollination. A third of the crops in the US every year depend on pollinators for their crops to produce yield. And this goes from high value crops like almonds to really common crops like soybeans, like you see on the right. And the main thing here is that without that habitat, we don't have pollinators. So we've come up with a solution, which is to have domestic bees in hives. And these bees are little, literally trucked on semi-trucks around the United States, going from crop to crop. Now this is a great approach for a while because it's basically bees on demand. We have them when we need them, where we need them, and that works really well. Just to give you a sense of how big this trucked migration is, there's one beekeeper who starts out in Idaho in the winter. He moves his bees in uh, January to California for the almond crop, then to Washington in March for the cherry crop, then to May in North Dakota, finally back to Idaho for the winter. There's other beekeepers who start out in Florida and go all the way to Texas or across the entire eastern seaboard to New Hampshire. I think these bees probably see more of the United States than most US citizens. <laughs> and this is again fine for a while because it gives us a lot of accessibility and a lot of flexibility. But we knew this was a very risky investment because this is one kind of bee. And these bees are moving all over the country. So if there was ever a disease that these bees got, it would spread really rapidly and have the potential to collapse the entire system. And unfortunately, that's exactly what's happening. Things went really well until 2006 when bees literally started disappearing, as you can see in these empty hives that I got so nicely placed on stage for you. <laughs> but the main point here is that um, we are now in the middle of the largest outbreak of colony collapse disorder ever. And this is not just in the United States, this is globally. Bees disappear from the domestic hives and don't come back. From 2007 to 2011, there was a 30% loss of hives every year. And last year was the worst, with another 50% of the remaining bees disappearing. This is already translating into higher costs for farmers to bring the bees into their lands. And you know that's translating into higher food costs for us. We don't know how much farther this decline is going to go. As I said, last year was the worst yet. So it's not slowing down and further declines will likely lead to further increases in our food costs. Yet again, nature to the rescue, we have another option. We can put some of that habitat back around farm fields. It doesn't have to be everything, but habitat smartly placed around the edges of farms can bring back the wild pollinators. And it doesn't usually just bring back one species. In New York where they're doing this, it's brought back 100 species of wild pollinators. This gives us great diversity and great resilience to disease. And it's been shown that those wild pollinators do a much better job. Two to three times better pollination of crops and they're much less susceptible to colony collapse disorder. So this is a really viable option that gives us a much less risky position for our food production. When we bring back some of that habitat, we don't just get the bees back. We get back something else that I want to talk about and that's pest control. When you lose the habitat, you lose the birds as well. And some of those birds can be really effective at eating pests that otherwise we pay a lot of money to control with pesticides. I'm gonna talk about coffee. I imagine a lot of you are coffee drinkers and you might not know what it takes to get that coffee from seed to cup. It usually takes a lot of pest management and sometimes really expensive pesticides. One example is related to this, what I think is a pretty cute bug, but it's not cute if you're a coffee grower. This is the coffee borer beetle and it's just coming into Costa Rica. It's been in other parts of the coffee and growing world for quite some time. And this beetle, cute and little, is absolutely devastating. It can destroy two thirds of a coffee crop in a season. In Costa Rica, this is adding up to $10,000 of loss per farm a year. And in Costa Rica, the annual average wage is $7,000 a year. So these beetles are taking away over an entire year's annual wage um, just at the early stages of their infestation. Pesticides of every flavor have been tried on these guys and are largely ineffective. The most widely used one is a neurotoxin to people. So that's what we're using right now on our coffee to try and control this beetle. If we put some of the forest back around coffee plantations, we get back birds. And birds like this one eat that beetle, sometimes really effectively. In Costa Rica, where some of that um, forest has been put black, there's been a 50% decline in the beetle on coffee plantations with obvious savings to those small plot farmers. So with all of this, I've tried to give you a sense of 
the picture we have for the way we manage our resources now and that we really are looking at pretty unstable investments. We continue to pretend that nature is not an important part of our water supply system, it's not an important way to protect ourselves from storms, and that it's not an important part of our food production systems. We now know that all of those statements are false and that we have an option which involves investing in nature. Lots of people are starting to have this realization and here's a quote from someone who has recently. This is Brett Adi. He's the owner of the largest beekeeping company in the United States. And he, after seeing most of his bees disappear, made this statement. I would have been insulted if you'd called me an environmentalist a few years ago. But what you would have called extreme, a light comes on, and you think, these guys really have something. Maybe they were just ahead of the bell curve. How many people in Bertie Madoff's scheme would have wished they were the ones ahead of the bell curve? and known in time to get out of the scheme. Well now, because you came today, you're all in that same boat, and you know that there are options out there. More people like Brett are changing the way they invest with their companies. Leaders in government are doing the same thing, and so the options are there. It's now up to all of you to reach out and grab those investments yourself and get out of the scheme before it's too late. Thank you. <laughs>